an intimate memoir, Big Sex, Little Death. Susie Bright is the host of Audible's In Bed with Susie Bright, the longest running sex ed show in the history of broadcasting. She was co-founder. <laughs> That's what they gave me. She was co-founder and editor of On Our Backs magazine and was the first journalist to cover erotic cinema and the porn business in the mainstream press. A progenitor of the sex po positive movement, Bright taught the first university course on pornography and brought lasting sexual influence to her role in films like Bound and The Celluloid Closet. Doug Henwood publishes the newsletter Left Business Observer, which analyzes economics and politics from a left-wing perspective and is a contributing editor at The Nation. He also hosts Behind the News, a weekly program on New York City's listener-sponsored radio station, WBAI. Following their discussion, Susie and Doug will take your questions, and then they'll stick around to sign books, which you can purchase downstairs on your way out of the store. Please join me in welcoming Doug Henwood and Susie Bright to The Strand. Hello. I was very flattered that when Susie asked me to do this. This is somewhat off my usual beat. Um, but, you know, you grow with challenges, so uh, no, I'm, no, I'm no, glad no. to be here. Doug is one of the few people who could talk about uh, sex, sexual politics, labor, Marxism, capitalism in crisis, and uh, family of origin issues equally fluently. I mean, there, were, <laughs> there was very few people on my short list. All right. Well, it's nice to be on that short list. Um, so, I really loved this book. I really enjoyed it quite a lot, and uh, everyone should buy a copy and take one home, of course, before, uh, before you leave. Um, but there are a couple of issues that you didn't really go into in as much detail as I would have liked, and one is Catholicism. Uh, oh. you, you talk a little bit about it, but uh, speaking as someone who was twisted by the Church of Rome, I was wondering uh, what its influence on you was. Well, there's a, there's a photo in the book that is very meaningful to me. There's a, a picture on every chapter. Uh, I wonder if I can look it up while I'm talking to you so I can hold it up like a slide. Um, look in that first, it's the one of my first communion. Ah. And uh, I'm, I'm seven, I'm walking in a procession, I have the little veil. Which chapter is it? Uh, I, it's one of those first ones, go, yeah, keep going. You'll, you'll hit it, there's no mistaking it. And um, uh, the look on my face, we had been prepared for this moment, you know, hours and hours of stories about how people burn in hell, you know, just uh, imprinted on our minds and you're, you're getting ready for, you're, you make a confession. And then um, where when you're seven, I mean, what is there to confess, you know? I hate mommy, I mean, that, I'm sure that was a big, big one. And then, and then you're going to get the sacrament, you're gonna get this, this host, in your mouth, which is, which is actually Jesus. Jesus in your mouth, yes. And, uh, and, and since he's in your mouth, you'll be able to talk to him privately. Uh, so I, uh, the, the anticipation and the look on my face there, I believed in God so sincerely. And it reminds me of how, how all children in calculated with religious superstition, you know, have these these moments, you know, it's just like Santa Claus and, and everything else, except it's not as benign. I mean, Santa was far preferable. But uh, if you could have seen me an hour later, I was shattered, you know. Jesus stuck to the roof of my mouth. There was no big talk. I felt like being given 14 Hail Marys and 10 Our Fathers and five acts of contrition was a lot for saying that I didn't like to wash the dishes. I, I mean, it was, it was overkill. I, mean, I guess they were trying to, it, that was why later when I um, had my first orgasm rubbing my pajamas, I was like, that's it. I mean, look what went on just for not washing the dishes. There is no <laughs> way. Um, but the other part of it is, is a kind of a, an ethnic thing. I mean, every there's different kinds of Catholics. And when you're Irish Catholic, uh, there's a lot of secrets and silence and harshness in the family about both your religious traditions and what's expected. I mean, many times people say, well, because you were brought up in a faith, I expect you know the Bible. No, you don't know the Bible. Uh, what the hell? I mean, the Catholic's I, not really supposed to read the Bible. <laughs> I might get your own ideas. <laughs> I know the, the stories that are in the Christmas carols, but that's about, <laughs> like that's about as far as I go. Uh, and, and instead, it's that kind of, there's, um, 
I don't know. I, I tell a story early on about the Irish side of my family and what I've been able to find out about them. And I know that they all, they all left Minnesota um, to get work in the, in the shipyards of Hunter's Point in San Francisco during World War II because uh, where they lived in a, in a ghetto in St. Paul, which is now a, a black ghetto but was an Irish ghetto, there would be signs on the doors that would say, no dogs, no Indians, no Irish. <laughs> And there was something about Irish being the last word, like as if we have to mention this, <laughs> right? You know, um, that that was on my mind. Um, I look forward, in some ways, to this book that I would maybe be able to reconnect with family members who had been cut off and for whom no one, you know, no one would, was speaking because of tragedies that befell them and. You, you just don't talk. You don't talk about it. And even if you decide you don't believe in God anymore, um, even if it's been a long time since you stepped foot in a church, the, um, that hangover, I mean, I think any, uh, it, it's just remarkable. Sometimes I, I live uh, with an atheist as my, my partner, and he was brought up atheist, and I'm always so surprised at some of his reactions to things. Like, you know, how do you get away with that? <laughs> so, it's um, it's a different point of view. Well, uh, the Irish side of your family also had a penchant for beating their children, didn't it? Well, yeah. I mean, um, no, I, uh, is there is there a is there a group that that gets out of that? Or is, is I think beating children's been in. Uh, yeah, it's quite in. But you know, I <laughs> the, the tales of your mother's brutality to you were really oh. quite amazing. <laughs> Uh, but you know, I think a lot of anti-porn activists always say, you know, people who get into porn, you know, it's because they're they're abused as children. Oh. Uh, do you ever get that one? Um, well, that's funny. You should say that because part of the the trope of the feminist anti-porn position is that violence is visited upon you by brutal, bestial men who have escaped the cage. And I remember uh, a long time ago there was a a. a what meant to be an earnest survey in Ms. Magazine about violence against women. You know, like we're gonna catalog, we're gonna do histories, you know, we're gonna lay it out here and do some statistics. And I was actually quite eager to participate and I remember, you know, flipping, there was a couple pages of questions and I kept thinking, why is there nothing about if you've ever been hit by a woman or if you've ever hit another woman or you know like why, why is there this notion that there isn't um, um, uh, violence between women that's maternal or you know in a sorority or a punishing aspect between women it was remarkable to me that that wasn't no there's no room for that in gender essentially yeah that <laughs> certainly isn't nobody comes to me and says I figured you were a feminist pornographer because your mother slapped you around <laughs> no no that's never come up <laughs> Um, also, uh, this has come up uh, just as I've been touring the book a little bit. I always find it remarkable that this isn't asked in other professions. It would be interesting, you know, to, to bring someone up who... Like a hedge fund manager. Hedge fund manager, what happened as a child? <laughs> you can tell us, right? You know, we know it was something awful. Uh, <laughs> certainly, I think of... Um, if you mean porn is in the commercial world of porn, it's very much a, uh, a part of show business, and it always has been. And m everyone who works in it below the line works across all genres. And now, you know, even now above the line, there's starting to be crossover. But nevertheless, it's it's part of Hollywood. And uh, when people say, you know, what about these 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 young people and you know taking off their clothes and waving their thong in the air and I always all I can think about is all the child actors I knew in sitcoms all I can think about is what happened to everybody in the Partridge family and the Brady Bunch um, I mean I grew up with those kids and uh, if you think you know if you want your hair to stand on end talk to people about what happens in um, the, the very mainstream of the entertainment business makes porn look almost um, family-like, cute. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, let's move forward to a more cheerful topic, your high school, which was like school. nothing like the high school I went to, let me oh. tell you. Uh, you worked in this commie paper there, which is quite a, quite a, quite a piece of work. Tell us about, was it Red Tide? It's the Red Tide, and uh, um, there's another, at least one Red Tider here. Where's Michael? Yes, in the back, slightly waving his hand. Um, I, I'm trying to find more of my... Um, my comrades from the Red Tide, every, every city I go to, I always hope there's one that's going to show up. The Red Tide was the longest running high school underground newspaper uh, that ever existed. And, uh, and it was entirely controlled by high school students. I mean, we did everything for better or worse. Uh, and we had, you know, we had that, nowadays probably people are more accustomed to this with with blogging but we have this way of like oh if we make a mistake or something's upside down fuck it you know revolution now remember that <laughs> we had this we had this headline <laughs> there was this point where what was it? it was when there was this these police actions in la high schools where they were both infiltrating like narcs posing as seniors were busting people and there was just this whole new br brutality and and dress codes and you know this martial law the lapd was really going to get involved in in our schools and the headline was supposed to be cops hit la but we ran out of room so it said cop shit LA, right? Well, <laughs> they just kind of crammed together. Um, but we, you know, we had all kinds of things. My uh, introduction to the Red Tide was um, Michael. I, I was just, had arrived from Edmonton, Alberta. You can not imagine what a turnip I was who'd fallen off the truck. I'm in this major, massive Los Angeles high school, and this guy in a, in a flak jacket with long, about 80 degree long hair <laughs> who looked like Jesus, like the Jesus I never met during First Communion, uh, all these years later, came up to me with a, a clipboard, and he said, I know this wasn't your exact words, but it was something like what I heard was, we want to bring lesbians and birth control to this campus. Will you sign this petition? <laughs> I was like, well, as a matter of fact, I do. <laughs> you know, like, Let me give you my John Hancock. And um, that week just set these things in motion. There was a, something called, uh, at our school, like many schools, the administration sponsored a, a thing called Girls Week, which was mother-daughter fashion show and bake sales. And uh, you, you get the idea. And a bunch of red tide women and other feminists who we considered ourselves the crucible of women's liberation, we had Women's Week, which included the lesbian panel, the birth control, the self defense, the women's history, you know, drag Holly Near uh, onto the field. I mean, you know, we had a, we had a whole, whole parade of, of activities. So, yeah, it was, it was both an amazing time and at the same point, I was getting in on the tail end of something. I had waited so long to grow up and be part of the revolution, and then when I got there, we were about to turn towards Reaganism, and it was very, it was very frustrating. I, I, I just felt like I was a, a minute too late. But at least you got denounced by the Bill O'Reilly of his time, right? Yes. Um, <coughs> there's so many, you know, nowadays when people talk about Glenn Beck and Riley and uh, who else, well, Rush Limbaugh, there were previous dudes. This guy named George Putnam, some of you may have seen him on YouTube because he did this famous anti-pornography creepy Cold War uh, chat. Have any of you seen him? And he had this amazing, this movie star voice. I can't imitate it, but it was like, you know, Charlton Heston. I mean, it was really smarmy. And um, one chapter in the book is about the night we heard that he was going to blast the red tide on the nightly news. He, you know, he was a really <coughs> famous broadcaster. And he held up our paper, and we're like, what is it going to be? Is it Vietnam? Is it cop shit? Is it, you know, Palestine? Like, no, the suspense was killing us. You know, we covered, we covered everything that was yeah. important. You know, so what would he pick? And I think his words were, I am holding before me the most disgusting picture I have ever seen. <laughs> and I'm like, is it? <laughs> and he's like, it is.